So today we're very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Rosalba Icasa with us. She's visiting us from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague in the Netherlands. And so Rosalba's research um, lies at the intersection of global politics, feminisms, and uh, decoloniality. Um, so she analyzes interactions between power and knowledge. And so she investigates gendered inequalities in such interactions um, across the global north and global south divide. She studies social struggles um, and follows communities who organize across borders to resist um, multiple interrelated <coughs> oppressions along the lines of gender, but also race, ethnicity, class, age and generations, sexualities and body capacities. And so Rosalba understands those social struggles really as epistemic struggles. So again, power and knowledge. And so tonight she'll take us uh, through some of the key concepts in decolonial feminist thought. Um, she's asking the question tonight, what can we learn from those social struggles that are resisting violent forms of power um, that are destroying land, the topic of this series, but also women's lives, and importantly, hope across the world. And so are those social struggles questioning our worldviews, the way that we see the world? But also crucially, what happens to the way we make sense of social struggles in global politics when gender is understood from its underside, and that is <coughs> coloniality. So very important questions that I think many of us will agree are not asked sufficiently um, in academia, especially not in Western academia. And so I'd like to make a short reference to one of uh, um, Rosalba's books, one of the books that she co-edited, which is co um, called Decolonization and Feminisms in Global Teaching and Learning, which is, I think, really a recommendable book. Um, and in the introduction of that book, the editor cite Bell Hooks, who said that the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility. The academy really is a site that can nourish critical thought, right? can change worldviews, and thus can change the world. But, so they say in this book, it can also stifle critical thought. It can reproduce dominant frameworks, as well as colonial patriarchal oppressions. And so in this book, they say that, for example, the composition of staff in academia really reflects structures of <laughs> domination rather than the diversity of society. So classrooms have been, so they say in this book, they have been both spaces of refuge and learning, as well as of further marginalization and further alienation. And so I'm mentioning this because I think we should always keep that in mind. And we should work actively, right, to counter those structures of domination. But to demand, dismantle those structures, of course, we have to understand them. And I really think that the lecture tonight, or Rosalba's work in general, um, I might not be completely objective because she's also one of my supervisors, um, but I think it really helps, her work really helps, you know, us to think through those, uh, through those structures. And so again, like in the other Stad Salons, um, after Rosalba's talk, we'll have time for questions. Again, please feel free to ask your questions. If you have a question in mind that's not completely formulated yet, still feel free to ask them. Um, everybody's here to learn, all of us, even those with most articles published, everybody's here to learn. Um, and it's sometimes through asking questions really that, that, that we learn the most, right? Also those following the lecture online, please do feel free to share your views, your comments, your questions. Um, I think you have to log into the platform before you're able to, uh, to post a question. So Rosalba, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here tonight. I think that what you said is the most interesting part of this lecture for now. But um, yeah, it was such a beautiful in introduction. Um, I prepared some written words uh, because my first language is not English. So I feel more secure when I share some of the ideas that I have been working when I'm reading. This is one of the, um, let's say, the problems with academia. It, it, it somehow 
make you distrust in some of the, um, of the ideas that you normally say without much preparation. But I prepare these words also thinking that so many of you perhaps um, have heard something about the coloniality and that might be curious to know where these ideas are coming from and how you can engage and do research with the idea of uh, modernity, coloniality, decoloniality. So I hope that you will be interested and whenever I sense that the energy of the classroom, room, uh, whatever is going down, of course I'm going to stop and check if you're still with me because um, it can be sometimes very dry, uh, some of the concepts and some of the ideas that I want to share. So thank you very much. Um, and especially I want to thank all the people that made possible that I'm here. Uh, Line, of course, but also all the technical uh, uh, team that is uh, hosting me today. Thank you very much. And I'm going to move a little bit because I want you to see some of the images that I will be sharing with you. Um, as you um, perhaps read in the, in the invitation to this seminar, this is the questions, these are the questions, sorry, that I want us to think together through the ideas that I'm going to share with you. Can we learn from ongoing social struggles, resisting violent forms of power, destroying land, women's lives, and hope across the world? And if so, how can this be encouraged and cultivated? So please notice that I'm not even now asking if this is possible. I know that we should do it, and I'm going to argue why, but I, I want also to transmit how this can be done even in a problematic and exclusionary space, space such as academia, particularly to people of color. But anyway, let me move into what I want to share before I um, start you know, going to every direction. Um, in the text, Dance, Pain, and Collective Memory, the artist and activist Paulina Trejo reflects on the international meeting of women who struggle organized by Zapatista women in Chiapas, in the south of Mexico, in December 2019. Paulina Trejo shares the following, and I open quote. On the last day in the morning, a choreography and a performance was organized in which many of us participated. We created a circle, and inside the first circle was another one forming an spiral snail. Someone at the microphone shared some words about the dehumanization that we face as girls for the simple fact of being girls. The performance was to honor the memory of disappeared and murdered girls and women. At the rhythm of the drums, we began the choreography moving slowly together. At some point, we jump, screaming, hitting the ground, then faded away, simulating to be dead women. The person who was at the microphone shared some words about the violence we experience. In the end, she mentioned that we are still in resistance and we all raise our fist up. There were tears running down my compañera's cheeks. I cried too. We hug. They didn't know me and I didn't know them. We hug each other while we cried nonstop. Before letting her go, I told her, I do believe you. You are not alone. There are experiences of violence that we share and that transform everything inside of us. To be able to listen to the mothers of women who were victims of feminicide or who after being silent for years revealed to have been raped hurts. There is a pain that we share, a wound that does not close because the violence has never stopped." End of quote. In this presentation, points of departure matter. In undoing colonial patriarchies, life and struggles pathways, Mexican anthropologist Xochitl Leiva tell us the following, and I open quote. The starting points that we select have a strong imprint that is not only symbolic, but also concrete and practical on what we do, think, and feel, and above all, in how we do, think, and feel it. The starting points intersect with the place of enunciation 
but cannot be reduced to it. Since 2008, I have collaborated with a group of indigenous and mestiza academics activists based in the Global South and the Global North, who have been conducting collaborative research, writing and teaching practices on the knowledges that are co-created by communities resisting violent forms of power, destroying land, women's life, and hope in Aviala, formerly the Americas. We have documented and disseminated our findings in books and academic publications, via itinerant schools, and with the creation of an autonomous, non-commercial publishing house, Editorial Retos. But most importantly, we have been reflecting together about the learnings that emerge from defending rivers, mountains, land, and our intimate relations with Earth. We are called the Transnational Networks Other Knowledges, Red Transnational Otros Saberes. For some of us who are based in academia in the Global North, to learn and teach about our relation to Earth as one primarily implicated in its consumption and destruction has meant to unlearn who we are. All the ideas that you are going to listen today emerge from these processes of unlearning. So my question to you is, which are your points of departure and what brought you here? The boring table that you are looking at uh, represents five years of my PhD research that explore how international relations and international political economy theories explain social resistance to regional neoliberal governance, things like the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. One of my early conclusions at the end of my PhD journey was that the shift from international relations to global politics was paying very little attention to no attention to two particular issues. First, the ways in which transborder resistances were challenging our frameworks of understandings of what is conceptualized as region. Second, the unspoken impulse to analyze and categorize resistance across borders. These conclusions lead me into these three other questions that I'm presenting to you today. The first one, what does it mean to think social struggles as epistemic struggles? The second one, who benefits from this rethinking? And the third one, can we learn from ongoing social struggles resisting, resisting violent forms of power is the one that I'm bringing for you today. But let me speak about the first question. The first question basically aim to um, think social struggles beyond capitalism. And this means that um, I don't want and I don't desire to explain social resistance through the same logics and the same rationalities that this social resistance are trying to resist in the first place. Therefore, the notion of social resistance as epistemic struggles. I'm trying to challenge the tools and frameworks of understanding that for so long we have been using to categorize and classify particularly those who are radically different from us. So to think social struggles as epistemic struggles is an invitation not so much to study them as objects, but rather to recognize the questions that they pose to our forms of understanding, particularly in critical academia. The aim of this question was, and continues to be, to instigate an engagement with social struggles that includes not only their relation to economic and political forms of domination, for example, against neoliberal globalization or capitalism, but also their capacity to generate knowledges and reveal the limits of our worldviews, including our frameworks of understanding. In sum, social struggles cannot be fully grasped just as a reaction to domination or just as the necessary or logical outcome of the processes that precede these particular forms of social resistance. 
rather, and this is the proposal of understanding social resistance as epistemic struggles, is that social struggles, when we understand it in their epistemic dimension, are trying to, or this notion is trying to characterize the creative power that the links from the logics of the systems of oppression. Social resistance as epistemic struggle is not just then determined by the systems of oppression, but by, but by a politics of affirmation. And I'm going to go back to this notion of affirmation later in my talk. Now, the second question, who benefits from this rethinking? Okay, fantastic, Rosalba Boya. Who benefits from this? And I'm always posed this question because this is a question of political economy of knowledge production in a world that, as we know, is deeply divided between those who consume and those who are consumed, including the life of others and the life of Earth, and how many of our desires and pleasures are actually related to yeah, the destruction of the life of Earth is you know, documented everywhere. Now, this is a crucial question because, as many of you know, today the ecological frontier coincides with the epistemic human frontier as the last resources are in First Nations people's land. For example, the resource war we are facing is one in which First Nations are struggling to preserve their lands, their rivers and mountains, but also their dignity, their rights to self-determination and so forth. So this is an inevitable question to ask from my point of view, of course. Now, the third question. This question is my current obsession, let's put it in those terms, and it deals with the pedagogical possibilities. I'm a teacher, basically. I see myself all the time more than anything a teacher and a mentor. So I'm obsessed with the learning possibilities that emerge by the rupture the refusal of what keeps us incapable of connecting with others who are radically different from us. This, this incapacity is conceptualized by the colonial feminist, philosopher and popular educator, Maria Lugones, as a failure of identification that operates as a fundamental principle of control to which one is subjected, but also subjects others. I will go back to this idea as well at the end of our presentation to explore how, how capable are we are to actually recognize ourselves on those who are radically different from us. Now, how to do it? Well, this is how the moment I encounter the coloniality. Now, you have heard something about it, but let me tell you a little bit of my perspective about this particular um, perspective option to be more precise. Having its origin in Latin America, the coloniality enters the social sciences as a field of critical inquiry concerned with modern and colonial structures of power, knowledge, gender, and subject formation, and proposes a turn to an epistemic or cognitive South in the reconstitution of global political societies. Essentially, the notion of an epistemic South denotes the existence of multiple epistemes or ways of knowing with the North Atlantic or Western modern just being one of them, the dominant one, but just one of them. I encountered decoloniality while doing research within the field of global governance in development studies a long time ago. <laughs> now, the field of global governance studies, which is what I started to teach in Europe so many years ago, has been concerned with explaining and interpreting the phenomena of governing across different scales and arenas of power. It's not only the state, but all these actors and layers of power and authority that this field of story is uh, concerned with. But when it's intersected with the interdisciplinary field of development studies, it focus, of course, turns to the so-called Global South countries, previously known as underdeveloped countries. Now, the introduction of the notion of governance in the field of development studies inaugurated a vast production of analysis concerned with formal, informal, decentralized, polycentric, and networked forms of governance, control, and authority in post colonial states and markets. Today, 
if you browse, if you uh, browse in the in the library, you can find a vast amount of scholarship informed by many theoretical perspectives, interpreting shifts, crises, continuities in the governance of development in these so-called post-colonial societies. Meanwhile, and I'm telling all of this because this is going to allow me to go into why it's important to have different points of departure. Anyway, meanwhile, analysis informed by post-structuralist, post-positivist understandings of power and politics generated analysis of underdevelopment as a form of governmentality that unfolds through network of forms of self-control of management. Other critical development studies perspective, including post-colonial and post-development scholarship inspired by critical and deconstructive social theory, contributed with interpretations on the violent impositions, peaceful acquiescence, negotiations, adaptations, and mimicry of modern governance institutions and norms in colonial, post-colonial, settler, and non-settler context. Now, in contrast to all this panorama, the modernity coloniality option approach, by focusing on the coloniality of governance and development is characteristically different or distinct from all these established approaches. More specifically, the colonial scholarship like post-colonial and post-development approaches is of course concerned with how governing unfolds through the imposition of development as a universalized narrative and project of civilization. Paraphrasing Walter Mignolo, development from a decolonial perspective denotes a local history, but governs as a global design. But as decolonial scholars, we are not just interested on how this is being imposed. Our task is to articulate the erasures, the silence, the violence that I was actually bringing here in the words of pa Paulina Trejo, that otherwise remains disregarded, disconnected, and very rarely addressed when we talk about governance and development in the context of the global south, so-called global south. So our task is to articulate these erasures, the silencing that entails the operation of governing, of control. Our task is to try to understand what is no more, or more precisely, what is produced as no more. Please do not confuse that no more as what in a modern and colonial chrono chronological understanding of temporalities is named as past. That no more inhabits multiple and entangled realities in plural temporalities right here, right now. Let's just think about the imperial and colonial origin of the city. But let me give you another example of these entangled realities in plural temporalities. This is um, the book uh, recently published by First Nation scholar Nick Estes in the right, um, Understanding Rock Resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline, that is entitled Our History is the Future. This is what I refer or what I understand as entangle uh, realities in plural temporalities, where the past is not past, <laughs> but is here. Or, in the other side, the rethinking the apocalypse, an indigenous anti-futurist manifesto that I truly recommend you to read it, that it states the following, and I open quote, Dear colonizer, your future <coughs> is over. End of quote. But anyway, how can one do research of what is no more? And more importantly, why and what for? To further explain the centrality of the notion of coloniality as erasure, that is the task of the colonial research, the colonial knowing, and understanding coloniality as erasure as constitutive of Western modernity, as what the colonial um, scholarship is concerned with, I will share with you the experience of the counterplantation system as developed by Haitian sociologist Jean Casimir. 
and I truly recommend also his latest book on the Athens a decolonial story. How are you? How is the energy? Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, you tell, you tell. Anyway, more than often, the Haitian Revolution of 1791 and the processes that led into the establishment of the first modern republic that resulted from a slave-led rebellion are simply erased from canonical text on governance, politics, international relations, development studies, you name it. But when Haiti is included, this nation is overrepresented as the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, a place of destitution, disaster, chaos, failed state, and a, state, and a case study holding important governance lessons for international aid practitioners and other countries on the so-called Global South. Nonetheless, people like DuBose and Jensen, co-directors of the Haiti Humanities Laboratory at Duke University, have noted that, and now you open quote, for most of the 19th century, Haiti was a site of agricultural innovation. Did you know that? Who knows that? Who knew that, sorry? Uh -huh. yeah. Well, they say that. Productivity, a site of agricultural innovation, productivity, and economic success, end of quote. So what went wrong? What other developing countries can learn from this? Advancing answers to these sort of questions will be a relevant task within the fields of governance and development, what my colleagues do at ISS. In contrast, the colonial scholarship is concerned about something else. For Haitian sociologist Jan Casimir, the focus should be, or has been actually, on learning from the reconstitution of a sovereign society led by individuals from African descent brought to the Caribbean as slaves that rejected French colonial order. Nonetheless, Haiti experiences are erased or actively reduced to be a case of failure. Indeed, from a decolonial angle, what matters is to ask how this reduction to failure is connected to colonialism, imperialism, race, and racialization in development, governance studies, international relations, and you name it. <laughs> Indeed, through research that prioritizes the approach of historical entanglements instead of local exceptionalisms or regional comparisons, scholars have demonstrated the connections between colonialism and slavery, the expansion of the international sugar market and a particular form of governance, the plantation, that extracted the life of the enslaved and of earth for the enjoy enjoyment of sweetened tea in the imperial metropoles since the 16th century. This is nothing new. But the colonial scholarship, by focusing on the coloniality of those historical entanglements, the silence, the erasure, or in other words, of what lies under these entanglements, have provided an additional set of interesting, interesting lessons. As carefully re researched, by a Latin American critical, historical, sociological perspective and methodology that foregrounds the experiential knowledge of those historically oppressed, Casimir traces down in Haiti how the disenfranchised African descended rural peasantry, Mon and the Yo, sustain a counter plantation system as a site of resistance running along the grain of colonial institutions in the form of a small plots of land inhabited by generations of extended families. I wonder how this can actually inform the discussions that you are having here about land. Furthermore, these families counted with their own conceptualizations and perspectives of themselves and the world some of which subsist to this day. This counter governance system, nonetheless, has been constantly erased and disregarded by traditional and contemporary 
Haitian historiography and by more recent diagnosis of Haiti's current governance and development challenges. Now, the problem with this erasure and this regard is that important lessons about life sustainability, autonomy, and self-reliance under colonial violence and slavery then, and under conditions of global, global climate change today, are muted. Social experience of life-affirming practices is produced as non-existent. To find ways to de-silence these experiences, to transform contemporary disciplinary frameworks and methodologies, common understandings of the world and of who we are as a world society have been key concerns of the colonial scholarship. In the rest of my presentation, I offer elements of a decolonial disengagement with academic research informed by my experiences as the colonial feminist in the field of governance and development. In so doing, I will foreground Latin American and First Nation indigenous perspectives, Afro-Caribbean and South African anti-colonial genealogies that have inspired contemporary analysis on coloniality and, and a specific orientation in knowledge cultivation. But before that, I need to know how are you doing? because it has been too much so far. Yeah, it's Friday. <laughs> okay, so you, you let me know, you let me know, okay. The coloniality has been defined as a liberatory praxis that emerged from First Nation communities and Afro-descendant people in Aviala. And there is struggles for political autonomy and land restitution. The coloniality has also been defined as an onto-epistemic option, a way of being unknown, okay? That in other words mean an option for ways of being unknowing, and that within academia orients an ethics in knowledge cultivation. While some others, or for some others, uh, the coloniality is a political imperative of transformation towards decolonization, Scholars like Madina Tlostanova argues about the relevance of decoloniality as an option, and I open quotes, because it is consciously chosen as a political, ethical, and epistemic positionality, an entry point into agency, end of quote. Belonging to a different geogenealogy, to that of post-colonial studies, decoloniality enters academic debates with a perspective on modernity as coloniality, articulated in its basic proposition as follows. There is no modernity, and I will say Western modernity, without coloniality. Now, coloniality understood as an underside of modernity constitutes a geo-historical and epistemic location from which reality is thought and sense from social struggle to questions of land. But modernity as coloniality also challenges the dominant version of history that places the British Empire, and sometimes the French, <laughs> as its center. Modernity from a decolonial perspective is understood then as three centuries older, and, and its, its study displays from the 19th century to the 15th and 16th century when the conquest of the America in 1492 and the control of the Atlantic was taking place. From this vantage point, Western modernity is not understood as a product of the Renaissance or the Industrial Revolution, but as three centuries older to emphasize the moment in which Europe, as a civilizational project, claimed universality for itself, producing all other cultures as particular, other, subaltern, backward, and so on. Now, let me go deep into coloniality. Coloniality is also a short way to speak about the matriz moderna colonial de poder, modern colonial matrix of power, a term coined by Peruvian sociologist Aníbal Quijano in the later 90s. For Quijano, this matrix operated as a structure of management, by controlling the economy, authority, 
knowledge, and subjectivities, gender, and sexuality. More recently, modernity coloniality have been conceptualized or has been conceptualized as two different geo-historical movements or forms of relations with what is real. In this way, modernity is seen as the historical movement of power, naming and representing reality. It is a movement of appropriating worlds of meaning. For example, non-Europeans were named Indians, uncivilized, not humans, in the colonial encounter. And more recently, a group of countries are named underdeveloped or lacking developed as they do not conform to the modern form, to the modern norm. Meanwhile, coloniality is the historical movement in which the erasure of knowing systems outside or in the margins of what was deemed as human rationality takes place. Once more, the counterplantation system in the experience of Haiti can be mentioned here to, to illustrate coloniality as erasure. Through the work of Gurminder Bambra, Manuela Boatka, and Sabelo Endolobu, it is possible to grasp the coloniality's world system theory, dependency, and underdevelopment theories lineage that to this day shapes its disengagements with the field of development studies, for example. Interesting, the coloniality entered the English-speaking debates on development studies via post-development scholarship in the work of Arturo Escobar, who in the article World and Knowledges Otherwise, the Latin American Modernity Coloniality Research Paradigm, introduced the notion of modernity as coloniality or modernity as co-constituted by coloniality. In the early 2000s, this perspective of modernity as coloniality was at odds with other debates in the field of critical development studies that were immersed in deliberations around the impact of globalization and hybrid forms of development, post-socialist regimes, economic transitions, and the reassertion of neoliberal intellectual agendas on poverty focalization, governance decentralization, and participatory approaches to development. In Worlds and Knowledge is Otherwise, Escobar's perspective of modernity, not as a totality, but as a totalizing project, and I will repeat that, modernity not as a totality, but a totalizing project, is contrasted with two highly influential scholars, US political scientist Francis Fukuyama and the British sociologist Anthony Giddens. At the end of the 90s, Fukuyama had coined the idea of the end of history to mark the victory of liberal democracy and market economics, while Anthony Giddens argue that globalization was the radicalization and totalization of modernity. Let me just share this very long quote because I want to emphasize something that is important for me to understand the possibility of an outside of uh, that totalizing project that we understand as Western modernity. Escobar introduces the question of Eurocentrism, colonial difference and border thinking as three important elements of the colonial thinking that today delineates its disengagement with the field, well, with any field, but anyway, in particular with the field of development studies. And I open quote, you can read it there as well. This, the exteriority to modern colonial world system, is precisely what most European and Euro-American theorists seem unwilling to consider that it is possible to think about transcending or overcoming modernity without approaching it from the perspective of the colonial difference. The various Eurocentric critiques of Eurocentrism, in short, this continue to be thought about from within Eurocentric categories of, say, liberalism, Marxism, post-structuralism, not from the border thinking enabled by the colonial difference. Critiques of modernity, in short, are blind to the epistemic and cultural colonial difference that becomes the focus of modernity coloniality." End of quote. So 
Escobar's contestation of modernity as a totality of what is real or possible challenges Eurocentrism, but also distinguishes the colonial thinking from other critical perspectives exploring modernity or Western modernity and modern development. This is the case, for example, of postcolonial scholarship in development studies. Postcolonial approaches in development studies have been firmly inspired by and in tension with Western philosophical genealogies of thinking, the postcolonial material, socioeconomic, and cultural condition, and in so doing, have expanded interpretations on modern development through notions such as ne negotiation, hybridity, multiplicity, subalterity, or even cultural geographies. In contrast, the colonial scholarship acknowledgement of an exteriority to modernity denotes ways of being, knowing, sensing, and world in the world that are non-modern and non-Western. However, and I want to be very emphatic with that, these are reduced to be non-modern, non-Western, named difference, the other, precisely by modern colonial logics and frameworks of understandings and these dominant rationalities. At this point of the argument, First Nations notions of human beings as belonging to Earth or the experience of the counterplantation system in Haiti are both relevant experiences that from my point of view can illustrate what existed and exists at the exteriority or at the borders of the modern colonial logics and rationalities of extraction of life and of the enslaved and of earth. In short, they shed light on the exteriority of modernity coloniality and help us to mark what lies beyond the interpretative analytic of development. Furthermore, given that colonial difference, as argued by Escobar, enables border thinking, this has been undertaken by the colonial scholarship as an epistemology, an embodied consciousness, knowing from the body, following the work of Chicana feminist Gloria Saldúa. Border thinking as a gnosis, or as a way of knowing, enabled by colonial difference, by not being the norm, also marks the limits of Eurocentric epistemologies, characteristically disembodied and anthropocentric, when confronted with the task of knowing, sensing, what is to belong to Earth or what is to be part of the counterplantation system. Recently, there has been important efforts to question the, polit the politics of knowledge that constantly emphasize tensions instead of overlaps and dialogues across the difference between post-colonial and decolonial thinking. This is certainly a relevant task, and informed recent conceptualizations of development from a decolonial angle that also recognize contributions and overlaps, does not collapse specificities, differences, and, producti and productive tensions. In so doing, development has been conceptualized as representation an articulation of colonial difference, or in other words, of the division between the human and the savage, between civilization and nature. The de development from this perspective functions articulating the separation between the consumer and the lives of the people and earth that are being incorporated, dispossessed, extracted, and consumed. The loss, the erasure, of plurality of worlds of meaning and forms of life is the coloniality of development. In short, development works as a mediation towards those who consume and those who are consumed. From this perspective, development comes to mean the loss of worlds of meaning, worldlessness, the loss of the relation with earth, earlessness, and the loss of the capacity of the contextual and enfleshed knowing, enfleshlessness. These losses are called the coloniality of development. And in doing so, they aim to counter ideas of progress, growth, frugal innovation, betterment, positive change, 
future, sustainability, and so on. These are the losses of development. To close this point, it becomes relevant to mention that as the coloniality enter development studies via anthropologist Arturo Escobar, one of the most renowned post-development scholars, these two approaches, post-development and decoloniality, have often been conflated or assumed to be addressing the same concerns in almost similar ways. Now it's also happening with the tradition of thinking degrowth, but yeah, that will be for another lecture. However, this is far from the case. Post-development approaches certainly pave the way for a decolonial disengagement with development, but there is a constant also productive tension between these two. Let me give you an example. The title of a recent compilation by Bendix, Mueller, and, S and CI, Beyond the Master Tools, question mark, decolonizing knowledge, orders, research methods, and teaching, can help us to illustrate this tension as follows. Whereas post-development scholarship, um, yeah, to be a little bit provocative here, any other critical um, scholarship, uh, whereas post-development scholarship is uh, still questioning the feasibility of going beyond the master's tool with a question mark, the colonial scholarship has never lived full time in the master's house. And as expressed by the colonial researcher Suleika Sheikh, it refuses his tools as these are implicated in the dehumanization of the other. The master house and his tools from a decolonial perspective are actively implicated in the consumption of life of others and of earth. In a nutshell, to the post-development critique, the decolonial option responds with ontoepistemic delinking, autonomia, disobedience, speaking in tongues, as Ansaldúa will say, as preconditions for plural liberations. To illustrate this point further, I will focus now on the coloniality of gender and to introduce gender as one of the master's tools. How are you? Argentinian philosopher and popular educator, Maria Lugones, coined the term coloniality of gender. To analyze, racialize, capitalist gender oppression when researching why people were so indifferent to violence against black women and women of color. We were just been talking about the current refugee crisis and how the double standards of protecting lives uh, is clearly in every single capital in Western Europe protecting those lives that are deemed as valuable where so many other crises were not deemed as relevant. So in researching these kind of attitudes and behavior, Maria Lugones were asking why this is happening, why the life of people of color are so deemed irrelevant for so many people, and particular the lives of women of color and black women. Why, why the violence is so irrelevant for, violence against them is so irrelevant for so many people. In her thinking, she wondered in which ways colonization and the dehumanization of indigenous and black bodies were part of the explanation on this contemporary phenomenon. In so doing, Lugones introduces the notion of coloniality of gender to theorize class and race, but also gender as a social category imposed in the colonial encounter through different technologies of the humanization and genocide, such as the systematic rape of colonized women. <coughs> in consequence, these categories, gender, race, are fictions, are seen as acting as universalisms, and as such erases and silence the feminicide racialized other. The notion of coloniality of gender of Maria Lugones extends an exploration of gender as a socialized sexual difference anchored to the history of colonialism. In this sense, Lugones thinks of gender as a mechanism of colonial domination over non-Western racialized 
bodies. And it is in this sense that Lugones helps us to understand the historical moment in which this specific system becomes a form of subjugation in a concrete mechanism of transformation and government of all life forms through the control of the bodies and subjectivities of the people who had been colonized. In the middle of the silence and erasure of coloniality of gender, the colonial feminists are asking the following questions. What plurality of forms of sociability that did not have as a deep root a dimorphic representation of male, female opposites of bodies, sexuality and spirituality were buried under the categories patriarchy, gender, women, men. If patriarchy is not universal or common to all culture, if it did not exist before, how do we show its analytical and theoretical limits without denying its current concrete existence and violence? Let's bring here, let's bring here an illustration of post-development and decolonial feminist scholarship contrasting contributions to the field of development. As it is well known, Feminist post-development scholarship, inspired by anti-essentialist critical deconstructive and social theory, has contributed to the unsettling of gender binaries in development interventions, for example, on sexual and reproductive health. This scholarship has contributed with a perspective of power in development institutions and norm as open-ended hence non natural but historically situated in modernity and even in British Victorian sexual, Victorian sexual norms. Contrastingly, the colonial feminisms have contributed to, to unveil forms of social organization, of sociability on the basis of fluid sexual dualities as already existing 500 years before the term of sexual fluidity enter feminist anti-essentialist lingo. So, where do we start to tell the story of non-binary sexualities? And what for? In many feminisms, gender, as probably you know, sometimes intersect with class, and is a given point of departure, and this is precisely the stark difference with the colonial feminism. Because from this perspective, from a perspective of decolonial feminism, gender is not our point of departure, but it's coloniality. Lugones concept of coloniality of gender allows us to understand the historical movement towards the imposition, modernity, of a Western, modern, global, Eurocentric capitalist heterosexual order that today is still in place. This is why the task of decolonial feminism is distinct and independent from established anti-essentialist critical feminist theories influenced by post-structuralism, post-humanism, and neo-materialism. Decolonial feminism priority is not the analysis of impositions of dominant representations of subalterity, but that of exploring reciprocal and collaborative ways of de-silencing, ways of being, knowing, sensing, made absent by the heterosexual colonial modern gender system. In his reading of Lugones, Sabelo Endolobu notes the following, and I open quote. Lugones posits that it is necessary to understand differential gender arrangements along racial lines, so as to highlight the two sides of the modern colonial gender system. The light side represents oppression along the lines of gender privileging white bourgeois men over their white bourgeois women, but without reducing them to the status of non-beings. The underside or the dark side represent the dehumanization and animalization to the extent that the colonized men and women are subjects not of genderization, but of mere crude sexualization into female and male non-beings, end of quote. Recent feminist decolonial scholarship foregrounds the silence of coloniality, 
and the erasure of the feminicide over it, which includes the racialized majorities of the world, but also earth and earth beings, reduced to be nature, and as such, a resource that can be owned, like land. Accordingly, the colonial feminists offer interpretations of contemporary governance of development as a violent operation. In that operation, the majorities of the world are reduced to subalterity, the plurality of their life-affirming projects and worldviews are reduced to mean underdevelopment, and earth and earth beings are reduced to mean environment or resources. From this perspective, the colonial feminists do research on what is not more, which is not a simple task, as you can imagine. As the colonial feminist, we are interested in finding ways of unearthing or de-silencing what has been previously produced as non-existent or non-intelligible by methodologies and frameworks of understandings that are epistemologically violent. Our interest, as articulated by Suleika Sheikh, is to develop approaches to knowledge and knowing that are not complicit with our own dehumanization. In the third and final part of my presentation, I go back to the question open in this uh, talk. Can we learn from ongoing social struggles, resisting violent forms of power, destroying land, women's lives, and hope across the world? And if so, how can this be encouraged and cultivated? <laughs> As a final step, I would like to um, share some tentative answers to this question that I have just repeated. The first tentative question that I, sorry, answer that I want to um, offer you is that yes, we could. We could um, actually learn from ongoing uh, social struggles, but only if, or what, not only, but if the way we think social struggles for land, for women's lives, and hope, foregrounds the coloniality of gender as our point of departure. To take coloniality of gender as our point of departure implies not to seek to classify what these struggles are or are not, but to learn how they challenge the logics of coloniality. An example of these logics which has been pervasive and deeply ingrained in modern colonial academia, is our impulse to classify, compare, name what our human and non-human others are or do. For example, in global politics analysis dealing with transborder forms of social resistance, the dominant impulse has been to explain if these are sufficiently counter-hegemonic or revolutionary or not and to what extent these contribute to destabilize dominant discourses and representations or not. Once our task is, to, is not anymore to contribute to the logic of classification of what social struggles are or not, we might ask ourselves how we make sense of social struggles of peoples and their communities without recolonizing such experiences without extracting the life of these experiences. Such a questioning has inspired the embodied thought and praxis that this presentation aims to enact. However, the implications of such questioning are far reaching that this small presentation and brings forward the task of decolonization of gender and the implications of this on feminism and non-feminist practices of knowledge within and outside academia. An endeavor of such magnitude calls for a collective effort in the, in the decolonizing of our methodologies and ways of working, which means not doing research on behalf of or about these struggles, but allowing these resistances to challenge the us that we are aiming to enact. And this is happening in context of horror and extreme forms of violence that lead to the question of ourselves, of how to advocate, advocate for life as a political act, as Silvia Londoño uh, invites, one that vindicates lives, bodies, voices in communal projects. As an epistemic proposal, the coloniality of gender 
call us to be attentive to our points of departure and to position ourselves on the side of what has been produced as inexistent. Women of color, indigenous women, trans people, by logics of dehumanization and classification of white, Western, bourgeois, Eurocentric frameworks of knowledge, including some feminisms. This attention might lead us to be brave enough to raise questions about life. Whose life are we talking about? Whose bodies are being made dispensable and disregarded by the logics of coloniality? How do we partake on this? Coloniality of gender as a point of departure allows us to learn from the 500 years old resistance of originary peoples in Aviala on how to address the above questions from our different collective life projects rounded in the territories in which we habit, uh, inhabit. It is from this point of departure that we have been able to perceive what the Zapatistas in Mexico or the NASA people in Colombia called the Dead Project, as what has been consuming land, women's lives, and hope. But most importantly, in listening about the Dead Project, we have realized that we are all implicated at different levels and to different extents in such a project, through our patterns of consumption and socioeconomic privileges that are sustained by trends of exploitation of certain bodies and destitution of lands and through our modern colonial subjectivities and sublime forms of self-control that are sustained in the disdain of some forms of knowing and sensing. To confront these means, for some of us, to embark into processes of unlearning privileges, epistemic, racial, socioeconomic, etc., and of relearning from communal forms of resistance to the death project of coloniality. If gender is a social construct, hence non-natural, but imposing a way of organizing and controlling society, then who imposed it over whom? What existed before and what still remains? These are the questions that might inspire more questions to come. The key objective of this presentation is to generate even more questions in each of you who might be interested in social resistance to global politics of death their actors and current processes. In particular, people aiming to think and relate to global politics and each other otherwise. To that effect, throughout my presentation, I have tried to share some collective and individual reflections. These have emerged from co-learning moments and encounters with people that within and outside academia are generating otherwise forms of thinking, sensing, relating to land, life, and, of course, women struggling across the Aviala. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosalba. Um, this was... Very inspiring, <laughs> I think. Um, okay, so um, this is the part where we um, open the floor to all of the views uh, here in the room. So um, who has a question? Lina, may I propose something different? Um, this is something that uh, we practice um, in the classrooms. Before you formulate a question, why don't you talk to your neighbor? and talk to each other, uh, because I know that perhaps you might have questions that your neighbor might have already the answer. So why we don't take three minutes, five minutes, talk to your neighbor if you don't know, it's a good moment to say, hello, I am this person. This was nonsense, or I didn't really understand anything. Did you understand anything? Please, let's take three, three minutes for you to think with others what you think is relevant for what you have heard. alone. So you are? Very nice to meet you. Thank you for listening. What do you think? What was, I said too many things. No, no, no. 
automated testing of the ocean. Okay, but anything that captures your attention most? So how it went? I just have a very interesting conversation about the images, and uh, I think that it's relevant that, that I say something. Most of these uh, designs are uh, by the artist Isabel Tello, who is a member of a cooperative of artists in the state of Puebla in Mexico. And it's a cooperative that is called Grieta Negra Taller, uh, that means a black crack workshop. And they have a very interesting principle. They subscribe the Zapatista principle of uh, relinquishing and rejecting private property. So their designs are communal designs, so they don't sell them. They don't claim any authorship. I, I wrote down their, her name because I'm old and I forget names. But, but basically, anybody of them claim any authorship with the idea that the art they produce is art that emerged from their experience in autonomous regions and in autonomous forms of, 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 of life. So the only thing they ask when I once met them was, please, if you are going to project our designs, always tell our names and ask people to disseminate our work. Because this is not our work, our, our individual. It's work that should be circulating, should be seen by everybody. And it's a really, really interesting cooperative, um, which I invite you to watch. They have a, a, a YouTube, and they, they have a, some means of, um, of expressing their, their ideas and their creativity. Grieta Negra Taller. I, I can write later on the name. But um, this is something that we were talking about, the, um, the idea of, of the images that you are seeing. Others are just pictures that I took in, in the streets. It's graf graffiti, the one with the two hands, the two heads, sorry, hands, heads. Um, is from a street in the middle of Oaxaca, this one, and I don't know the author. I was asking the lady uh, who lives in, the, in this house, but um, she didn't know. One day, it just appeared, and I love it. I normally present it when I talk about modernity as coloniality, as how these two historical movements cannot be uh, understood separated from each other because they co-constitute each other. And by having this perspective is not the right or the only perspective. It allows me then to see the universalism and the limitations of many of the concepts that I was using before. Um, anyway, so this is something that we were just talking. And then we start talking about Bans Bansky, Bansky, <laughs> which I really like. But I, I, I was also saying I would love to know who he is to ground him, to know where, why he is producing this art. Because from my point of view, is is a reflection of um, the criticism of neoliberalism in Britain, which is very, very important. I used to live there. Um, but anyway, that's another conversation. So questions, comments, remarks, any question is valid. Shall I circulate the microphone? Good. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was super interesting. I have a question. So the lecture was very academic centric yeah. in the discussions. And so about modernity, which is a totalizing project as the only way to look at the world. Um, I was thinking maybe from a more political conversation, we see in the media that uh, China is posing a challenge to the Western way of seeing the world mm -hmm. in terms of uh, as, a, okay. as a civilization, as a way of looking at the world, as a way of organizing society. What do you think about that? Like, it why, wasn't is it, why is it a challenge? China is challenging the European or Western worldview uh -huh. in how we're dealing with certain issues in our society. Can you give me an example? Yeah, like the COVID, COVID crisis mm -hmm. or the way they are controlling the population. Okay. Uh, well, communist, uh, uh, the, the Chinese communism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you want my opinion on Chinese foreign policy? Or <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. No, that is a challenge to westernization, which is one of the main distinctions that, um, for example, Walter Mignolo is constantly talking about. I, I, don't take me wrong. I, your question is very relevant, but something that I constantly criticize precisely from uh, Walter Mignolo, that, and don't take me wrong, is a, is a good friend of the family. It's a good friend of uh, many people that I know. But this, this emphasis on China is, um, is actually addressing the, the grown question from my point of view. 
in, um, in, in parts of the discussions about the decolonial. When we talk about, and, and he writes about, these are not my ideas, when we focus on the challenge that China is posing to the West, we're actually uh, failing to observe that China is using the same mechanisms uh, uh, of modernity that any other Western state has been using. Like, for example, the police interventions. It's an authoritarian regime, of course. Don't take me wrong. But how is it controlling its population is also through the mechanisms of, um, of the state, which in any case is challenging the foundations of the West that from the perspective of uh, the colonial critique is, um, yeah, the coloniality of power. And it expresses in uh, ways of authority and control and domination through the state, but also the economy or capitalism in the, in, in, in the case of the West. So he has a splendid set of articles actually distinguishing what this challenge is about. And what he says is that China is not challenging the West is actually a re-Westernization, uh, but in this case with a different leader, and this leader happens not to be a Western country, but happens to be China, but using the same principles of domination and control that are part of Western uh, modernity. So that will be part of my 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 yeah my answer, uh, but I don't think that. I don't think that the, the, the colonial option should be just understood as a challenge to the West. I think that should be read from a personal point of view as a challenge of the erasure of uh, the rest <laughs> as irrelevant or the, uh, the domination, the, the, the idea that one particular way of understanding is the right one or the universal one is, is, is is basically what I constantly say to my um, yeah, to the students in ISS who happen to come, most of them from the global south. It's, it's so easy to say, ah, the problem was the West. No, 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 no. The moment we're speaking colonial languages and the moment we don't know uh, many of, of the, of the uh, thinkers that are not part of the canon or that we go through a westernized um, system of education, we're also part of the problem. It's not as easy as saying the problem is the West. <laughs> now that will descend into fundamentalism and all the kind of conversations. But um, I hope that that is part of the answer. Okay. And I can tell, tell you later on the, the article where Mignolo develops this idea of westernization, re-westernization, re-occidentalization, de-occidentalization. It's, it's really complicated. Perhaps John knows where. <laughs> yeah, there was a question over there. Mm -hmm. So in a way, my question is, couldn't we replace modernity as um, state governmentality and capitalist system? And, and why should we use a new word to refer to these two things, which are destruction of societies and states and capitalist exploitation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, I see your point. Um, I think that one particular clarification is that when we analyze governmentality, we are still analyzing uh, modernity. Uh, when we speak in uh, the colonial scholarship about uh, coloniality, we are actually trying to um, understand what is erased with our obsession with governmentality. What are the practices that are not necessarily uh, contained or totally contained or totally um, intelligible to our framework when we use the notion governmentality? So no, when I speak governmentality, I'm still in the first movement. That is the movement of classification of Western modernity that we, in this equation, is modernity. Now, why we need a new grammar? Because unfortunately, the frameworks, and this is much better developed by the elders of the coloniality, because unfor unfortunately, 
um, some of the frameworks that we have been using are still reproducing the rationalities and the logics that aim to overcome. Like for example, extractivism in academia. Uh, we might be Marxist, neo Marxist, post whatever critique, but nonetheless we go, we extract knowledge, and then we publish papers. So how can we actually create a praxis, because the coloniality is not just, a, a, let's say, a academic perspective of pretends not to be, and its origin is not in academia, is not just um, extracting knowledge for the sake of uh, creating knowledge that can be later on classified, etc. Et now, that is one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that, for example, and I have always this conversation with my colleagues at ISS who are Marxist. Um, I think that um, is not my task. It has already been done, um, the silence of uh, Marxism in relation to race and racialization. There are splendid work that we can read. And of course, the coloniality of power as proposed by Aníbal Quijano is trying uh, to center around uh, how precisely in, let's say, structuralist theories of exploitation, the question of domination uh, he understands this differently as exploitation, is not considered. And race and racialization is simply outside of the question. Now, the implication for today's left, and we were talking about that in the lunch, leftist regimes is that still the logic of modernity, the logic of improvement, the logic of improving the other, that happens to be a racialized other, uh, is it still present in, in not only in Marxist analysis but, uh, or a structuralist analysis of a structuralism, but also in uh, policies uh, oriented to, towards the left. So that's why the grammar, a new grammar is proposed. And in proposing a new grammar that doesn't belong to Western modern genealogies, this is what many argue within the coloniality, we're already enacting a decolonial move. We don't need Foucault. We don't need Foucault to speak about coloniality because we need Foucault for governmentality. But we don't need Foucault for coloniality. For coloniality, we can grasp with Ansaldúa. But the grasp is an enfleshed one, it's an embodied one. The colonial win is not something objectively real there. It's, uh, it's, it's sense, as I try to transmit, not through academic uh, wording, but through the work of an artist, a decolonial artist as Paulina Trejo. She has fantastic work, by the way. Google her. Um, anyway, I hope that this makes some sense. Any question, comment? If you didn't like it, you like something, you were lost in translation. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. The question is, yes, I can try, but then we have to engage on a conversation of what is knowledge. How are we validating what is knowledge? Um, I, I have been, and I, I, I don't want to sound like pretentious or um, how do you say when everything goes? Um, I'm, I'm losing the term. Anyway, no, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to question also that the moment we engage with the idea this is knowledge, we're already are pre-assuming that there are some valid forms in which knowledge is accepted as such. And, and I want to, to actually refuse that. I want also to question ourselves in, in the frameworks of understanding that we have in our different disciplines, what is accepted as valid knowledge, why? For example, um, I'm, I'm not going to give an example from my own research for various reasons, let me use the example of very brave uh, young researchers who have just finished their PhDs um, through the implementation of 
non-extractivist, non-colonial uh, methods, well, sorry, they will kill me if I say methods, uh, practices uh, inspired by the colonial feminism um, in which they are um, foregrounding and desilencing the knowledge of particularly black women in Deutsche Academia. Um, this is a thesis that is called liminography, goggle her, goggle it, produced by Suleika Sheikh that I'm constantly quoting. She recently graduated from, from the PhD in development studies in ISS. And the statement of her dissertation is, in this dissertation there is no findings. Because what is called findings is already validating a violent form of producing knowledge that in her case as a woman of color from South African uh, origin is produce uh, is a dehumanizing exercise of herself. So she create, created her own approach to knowledge and she called it liminography. Liminal from borders, the liminal space, and graphia is not the writing, actually she went to uh, the original Latin of the world because she only speaks English and that's one of the colonial uh, undoings that she's trying to enact. She only speaks one colonial language, but anyway. Um, the Graphia in its Latin origin apparently is craving, craving goods, no? craving uh, pieces of, of good. So she calls this approach liminography and in an attempt to, to actually convince, or not convince, but invite the panel who evaluate her dissertation to understand that the knowledge that is produced in academia on women of color, like her, is like a wound, is reenacting the wound of colonization. So the way she presents knowledge is through poetry. That, as many of you might know, is one way in which black feminism constantly um, challenges and produces or cultivates knowledge against their own erasure. So this is for me knowledge. This is for me knowledge that can be created through a very particular method that generated poetry, but also, for example, that rejected the writing world, world as the only possibility of transmitting what she found about the role of uh, black and women of color in Deutsche Academia, which is they are not present. There is no women of color in Deutsche Academia, basically. Well, very few. Um, but she also, for example, experienced with um, podcasts, collective podcasts. And she has a very fascinating elaboration of why these podcasts are findings. Well, of course, she doesn't call it findings. And these are collective conversations in which women of color and black women who have no space in Deutsche Academia reflect about this craving, this, this violent form in which uh, knowledge of experts on the body, on sexuality, you name it, have used the body of racialized people to claim expertise. So that's what I was saying, what is knowledge? What are, how are we def de um, defining knowledge? Another example, also from a recent research that I supervise, um, this person has been working with uh, uh, traditional midwives in, in the state of Chiapas in, 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 in Mexico. And um, in the presentation of her findings, um, one of the members of the, of, the, of the panel actually asked her, how am I supposed to validate this? And one of the uh, consequences of this question is now that one of the researchers following the path of these two researchers recently graduated from the PhD program at ISS is that she's now exploring what will be alternative sources of validation of what emerge when you desilence the knowledges that are there. Now, there is a fantastic research that I also would like to refer to uh, by Ri, Jiang Ru, Jiang Gi Ri from South Korea. She produced a beautiful book I recommend it to everybody who is interested that is called The Colonial Feminist Research. And she developed the notion of rememory, 
to, um, to bring the past of her relationship with her mother to think about the present of her life. And as feminists, this is something that is coming from a very particular tradition of thinking selfhood, that you are exploring the world through a deep reflection on selfhood. But in her case, as a decolonial feminist researcher, she's not just she's not use, she's not using sorry psychoanalysis of or critical self reflectivity. She's using the remembering and remembering of her mother as her alien other because she was not an educated PhD person as herself to talk about the silences of feminism. And it's a fantastic way of producing, well, not producing, cultivating knowledge that has no validation if what you are looking is findings or objectivity. But nonetheless, in her argumentation, she's saying, well, it's a knowledge that heals, that heals the colonial wound. One of the principles of feminism that comes from Maria Lugones is that this incapacity of relate to, so, to people that is radically different from us, in her thinking, is it emerges from how we alienate our own mothers. And she has a beautiful text on how she actually says the way I learned the incapacity to um, relate to others who are radically different from me it started when I otherized my mother as someone less educated than me or someone less uh, relevant than me. So, of course, there is a tradition in women of color, third, third world uh, feminisms, recovering this initial fundamental relation to then write about how we interpret the world. Now, my own research. What can I tell you? There are so many things that I can share, but um, currently we are doing research, and I say we because it's a collective research with the uh, collective Sumil Moktan from Yucatan, Sinanche, where we also have um, um, a group of activists from, um, and scholars from the network of other, other knowledges. We have a productive um, kind of um, alternative production um, project with bees and the care of the bees. And um, something that we are trying to do research about is the pedagogies that emerge from caring for bees in the way Mayas used to do in the peninsula before the uh, coming of agrochemicals and the Green Revolution. And these practices are still in the, alive in the community. Um, how this is going to look like, I don't think that it's going to look like in papers. I think that what is informing is the reconstitution of the community that has a lot of migration, has many other problems, unemployment, you name it. So not every of the, yeah, not every of the research or the knowledge that is being cultivated within this framework is going to fit on a on a paper or a book or or because it's also not the the, the intention. That's what the, the second question of the what for, who benefits, is part of this. Um, invitation to think through the coloniality of gender and with the colonial feminisms or the coloniality in general. Is that an answer? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> any other question, any other comment, uh, suggestion? There is a question in the ah, chat. Yes. On the chat. So I'm reading out loud what, yeah, yeah, yeah. what was written. Um, modernity brought as many complex concepts and advances in various fields like human rights and vaccines, for example. The argument of going against that is being appropriated by extremists, mostly from the right, as we see in the discourse by Trump, Putin, Bozrano, and Le Pen, and could lead co to catastrophic consequences. Um, they are asking for your reaction to this. Well, I think that uh, modernity also brought genocide. And not being able to see um, the conquest of the Americas or colonization or slavery as part of this narrative is a problem with modernity, Western modernity. So the problem, as I was mentioning since the beginning, is not that we need to get rid of the, of the West. No. We need to understand that there is an underside on all these categories. For example, all these... Um, these, uh, let's say, benefits of modernity. 
Uh, let me give you the example of human rights. This is a constant reflection also at ISS because there is a whole a discussion on, on, on social justice and human rights. And the problem is not human rights, but it's uh, the universalist assumption of a particular human nature and hu uh, understanding of what is justice. As if, as if there is just one uh, understanding of how this justice should look like. And this is a very simple kind of answer. Um, what I'm trying here is to, let's say, bring the question of not only of pluralism in law, but actually the assumption of a purity in law that then includes these different frameworks, but then there is a core, a pure core, that has to be enriched by the inclusion of these diversities. That's what we are challenging, that the, the initial uh, the initial existence of justice is, is a singular one, when it, when it has been plural since the beginning. Um, so that one thing. The second thing is, um, I don't think that we need to conflate this questioning of the, of the underside of modernity as um, catastrophic. I think that is a much more truthful understanding uh, that can also lead us into see the limitations and do something before it's too late <laughs> and we, this, you know, uh, this, yeah, destroy the planet. Um, I think that is a much more, of course, one has to be brave because I'm not speaking from someone that has not been westernized. I'm speaking in English. I was educated in Spanish. So I'm not out of the problem, I'm part of the problem. And it is catastrophic if we don't see this on their side and if we don't see that the expansion of capitalism and modernity, just to address the first part, is intimately related to conquest, uh, slavery, and the destruction of the planet. So. I think that here is the, 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 the invitation. We need to be honest and brave to face that and then act according. That was also the invitation of can we actually recognize um, and connect with others that are radically different from us? That is the invitation of the whole, of the whole uh, lecture. It's not canceling, it's not rejecting, it's not descending into chaos just because we are questioning what we know so far as the only valid form of being in the world. So that, that is the message. That is my reaction. Yes, uh, because you were mentioning law, I would, I would love to know if you were also using sometimes, believe me, I'm wrong, but the sociologist uh, Susa de Santos, mm. and especially I think he, he was mentioning that some groups can use hegemonic tools to have counter hegemonic uh, effects mm -hmm. or reorganizing the world or so, so I would like to know if you are also sometimes referring this kind of. Uh, are you? I used to teach ec um, ecology of knowledge, no, the epistemologies of the South and the ecology of knowledge. I teach it for I don't know how many years. I, actually, it's a very pedagogical article. It's called the the something about the, the ecology of knowledges by Boaventura Sosa Santos. And he's a lawyer, a sociology of law, and he's very well known for um, uh, yeah, articulating this idea of epistemologies of the South and the importance of his, his uh, Portuguese um, of really uh, create the conditions for different ways of knowing epistemologies to um, yeah, to be in the table of those that set the conversations uh, and decenter the dominant uh, Western modern epistemology. So he coined this idea of epistemologies of the South. He's not necessarily who uh, thought it first, <laughs> but he coined the term. Um, so what is relevant from, from me of his thinking and I use it in an article that I wrote a long time ago about the limits of um, uh, legal pluralism, um, especially uh, when we are dealing with 
forms of justice that doesn't have a, a, a punitive understanding of justice, but um, in that moment, yeah, the, 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 the question on transitional justice was starting to emerge. So I was questioning, okay, what other forms of justice can be, can be embraced that is not just punitive, but not, not that also don't share the same understanding of, of humanity. Um, but anyway, that was a long time ago. And what Guaventura de Sousa Santos is helping us to understand is this idea of ecology of knowledges. We need to understand, as we are, I think you are very young people, you now understand the, the, the importance of caring for, yeah, for ecologies everywhere, and everybody is trying to do its best. So I think that this idea that there are a vastness, an immense vastness of knowledge um, is very important pedagogically speaking, but because as we care for plants and as we care for animals, we also need to care for those who have been preserving knowledges for preserving those plants and those animals. And concretely, it happens to be people who is uh, dealing with uh, the destruction of their lands or the appropriation of their lands. So it helps me, the colleges of knowledges, it helps me to trans transmit to the students when you destroy an ecology, you destroy the knowledge with that ecology, but also the people that lives in this ecology, that sustains life in that particular ecology. And that's what I found his thinking very, pedago very, very pedagogical to speak not about we are against the West. No, we're not thinking about that. We are just trying to understand the underside of Western modernity, come to terms to it, realize how implicated we are, and actually enact that ecology of knowledges. Really plural, plural um, understanding of the possibility of sustaining life cannot only happen if we only care for, uh, for nature. We also need to preserve the knowledges and the people. Uh, we were in lunch, we were talking about a meme. I love memes, I teach with memes. I'm actually looking someone that can do PhD, a PhD research on memes because I think that they are fascinating. And one of the memes that I was sharing in the lunch says um, that if you care for, how it was, Line? If you care for, for plants, no, if you care, if, you, if, you, if your politics, how, how it was? If you, if you care about ecology without politics? Ah, no, no. If you care for ecology without anti racism and anti capitalism, your environmentalism is just gardening. <laughs> I love it. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. That is exactly. It's like uh, self help courses, Osho style. Well, yeah, but you are implicated in, in feeling yourself good with the destitution of so many people in the planet. That's another conversation on decolonizing the self. Any other question, comment? Yes? a huge conference in The Hague. I don't know if you knew about it, the Degrowth International Conference. And there was a, a, an attempt to have this conversation between the coloniality and the growth. And I think that uh, we can converse, but our questions are, are, are different in, in, one, in one way. That's the way I, I spoke to my friends and colleagues there. Um, the question of autonomy. The question of autonomy, I think that is much more important um, in some of the um, communities uh, defending land than uh, the whole paradigm of the growth. So my question is how can we have productive conversations that really takes very seriously, on one hand, what does being autonomous mean uh, at all these different layers that I'm trying to address here, that is not just um, epistemically, but uh, materially, socioeconomically, but also very importantly um, in relation to how we actually produce the knowledge about these initiatives themselves. That's one thing. And the second thing that we brought into the table, and yeah, it was controversial, but yeah, I will say it, why not? <laughs> 
is that the degrowth movement, at least in the Netherlands, remains extremely white and extremely bourgeois. So how can this not be talking to the anti-racist movement in the Netherlands that is already engaging with First Nations defending land in the Americas, and I mean Americas from Canada to Patagonia. Why there has not been these conversations? We didn't resolve it. <laughs> so um, that's what I said for another conversation because it, it, it crosses the, the agenda, the research agenda that we have, but it also crosses its politics and, it, and, it possi and the possibilities for coalition within the context of the Netherlands, that it was really difficult. But at least we have the conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Don? Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. You are very patient. Thank you. <laughs>